morally responsible for what he does, and you can't hold less than a person morally responsible. He has various names in scripture, horrible names, if you knew their meaning, you'd be able to say that. Yeah, that the 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 Abaddon, if you know those are horrible names. Horrible names. Horrible names. More than that, the Bible gives him descriptions. A snake, but he is a wily serpent. He is described in terms of a, a prowling lion, and he is also described in terms of a dragon. Now, would you like to be left in a room with a snake, a lion, and a dragon? As soon as you pray in the name of Jesus, you are in a room with those three, and they are not to be thought of lightly. For that's exactly what he is. He is also described in character as a liar, a murderer, a slander, a slanderer, an accuser, an adversary, a destroyer. You're beginning to get the feel of him. Why is he like this? Where did he come from? Did God create him? Yes, God created him. But just as God created man good and then man decided not to be, so God created Satan good. And he's known what good is. For the Bible talks very clearly and says that Satan was and is an angel, which is a higher order of created beings than men. And he was an angel, and he was in heaven with God, and he was good. Why then did he decide to go the way he did? He decided to go that way for the same reason that we decide to go that way. He wanted something for himself rather than for God. And he wanted to be able to say, Mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's what he wanted to say. He wanted to change one word in the Lord's Prayer. Mine instead of thine. <laughs> if you trace back human rebellion against God, you can trace it back to the same To be able to say mine instead of thine. So we can't point a finger at Satan. We do the same thing ourselves. Now his motives, therefore, are primarily pride, which is sin, and which in turn leads to hatred. And hatred leads to be, you to be destructive and to want to break down rather than to build up. And therefore, Sarah Satan Snema. now has a, an exclusively destructive role in society. Now Jesus himself took Satan desperately seriously. He never made a joke about him. He never laughed at him. He never caricatured him. Here are some of the titles that Jesus gave Satan. He said he is the prince of this world. When Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, Jesus did not say they are not yours to give because he knew perfectly well they were Satan's to give. And it is a, a horrible thought if you really realize it that the world in which we live is ruled over by Satan. He is the prince of this world, but let's take it a step further. Do you know that another title Jesus gave to Satan? He said he's not only the ruler or prince of this world, he is the God of this world. The only other person beside his heavenly father to whom Jesus ever applied the word God was Satan. He said, my heavenly father is God of everything, but of this world, Satan is God, which means very simply not only that Satan controls this world, and is able to manipulate science and education and politics for his own ends. More than that, Satan is actually the real God whom most people on earth worship, whether they know it or not. That behind so much religion, behind so much activity, Satan is the one who's being worshipped. He's the person. And even by some who go to church and chapel on Sunday, in reality, he's their God. For they worship the things that he offers them. They want the things of the world that he belongs to and rules over, rather than setting their mind on the things that are above where Jesus is. And if you want this world, and if you want the things of this world, then I give you a piece of advice. Make Satan your God. If you want this world, he's a wonderful God to have because he'll give it to you. There's only one snack. There's always a price to pay. When the bill comes in, you may not be quite so happy, but he'll give it to you. He can give you money. He can give you fame. He can give you anything you want because it's his to give. Where have you been, Satan, says God in the book of Job? Well, I've been patrolling the earth. I've been looking around my estate. And he had. Now, let's get this clear. That doesn't mean that God is helpless in this world. It does mean, and we've got to think this through, that God is allowing Satan to be prince of this world and God of this world. He's allowed it. 
And people say, what does God think he's doing allowing that? Well, I would just say my only answer to that one is, what's he doing allowing you to be like you are? Why should you blame him for allowing Satan to rebel when he allowed you to? The answer is very simple. He's a father and he will not force any of his creatures to go his way. And he gives you freedom to rebel. And we can't grumble about him giving the angels freedom, though they have superior intelligence and strength, because he gave us the same freedom and we've used it in the wrong way. So that's what kind of a person he is. So he seems to have a special interest in the earth. He seems to be the prince of this world, the prince of the power of the air. Therefore, wherever I pray between me and heaven is the air, and I'm praying right through the territory of a prince of darkness whose avowed intention is to establish on earth a kingdom of disease, a kingdom of death, a kingdom of darkness in which he has the final word. That's his intention. Some of you listen me, listening to me tonight just know how seriously you take him. I, I just hope you never do have a direct encounter with him because it's pretty scary. And you can only come through it because you know that he's an al already a defeated foe. Do you know there are two books in the Bible that the devil hates more than any other two books in the Bible out of all 66? There are two that say more about him than any others, and it's these that he has attacked more than any others. They are the one at the beginning and the one at the end, Genesis and Revelation. And do you know why he hates them? Because Genesis describes his devices and Revelation describes his doom. And he hates those two books. And there has been more scholarly attack on the book of Genesis than any other book, and more attempt to turn it into myth and legend and away from fact than any other book in the Bible. Why? Because Satan doesn't want you to believe that Genesis 3 ever happened. He doesn't want you to know how he got hold of Eve. He doesn't want you to believe that he said what he did to that first married couple. And he attacks the book of Genesis. But the other book which he hates more than any other is the book of Revelation. Because as you read through that book, you come to a point where it says that the devil himself will be cast into the lake of fire. He'll be bound in prison first and not allowed to trouble men. And then he'll finally be put in the lake of fire. He, he so hates that bit. And I'm going to tell you something now that may make you a bit scared. But when I took you through the book of Revelation, I preached my way through that chapter. And you know, when I preached through the book of Revelation, there are more disturbances and things go wrong in the congregation than in any other series I ever take. And I came to that chapter and I preached my way through it and a tape was made up there, this is just a few years ago, and about 40 miles from here down on the south coast of England, one of those tapes, that series of tapes, went to a family of new Christians. The wife had been a Christian about six months, the husband and teenage um, son or daughter, I forget which, had just come to the Lord, and they were building themselves up, listening to tapes from here, and they listened to Revelation, and they came to the tape which described the downfall of Satan. They were sitting in an ordinary sitting room, listening, and when I began to mention Satan, over on the tape, on top of my voice, blotting it out, there were, was a shrieking foreign tongue, and they could hear my voice in the background, but they couldn't make out one voice one word that I said and they got scared and they sent for a minister whom I know and he went to them and they said this is what happened and for about seven minutes we couldn't hear a word of what Mr. Paulson was saying so he said well play it through to me again they played it through the second time and they listened and when they got to that point do you know there was not one word or one sound for seven minutes on the tape now that's who I'm talking about tonight. I'm as serious as that. He hates people talking about him in truth and warning people about his intentions. He just hates it. So take him seriously. I must tell you that the Bible makes it absolutely clear that Satan is already a defeated foe. And if he gets hold of you, he's bluffing you. Call his bluff. If you've been baptized, say, Satan, I'm not only dead, I'm buried. You're talking to a dead man. Don't you know that in baptism you were buried with him? You are buried. That's the point of baptism, to have a funeral of someone who's died. And the funeral helps you to say goodbye to an old life. It, it says, that's finished, that's the last time I see that. Life. And Satan doesn't like people getting baptized for that reason. He doesn't like us having a public funeral of someone who's died. 
because you see when you reckon yourselves dead and call his bluff and say I'm dead and buried and Satan you saw my funeral whether it was at Millmead or Commercial Road or somewhere else you were present at my funeral service I'm dead and buried stop tempting me you will find to the to your extraordinary delight that he has to go resist the devil and he'll run from you and you resist him on the ground of fact and on the ground of the word of God well that's the real battle that's on let me now then talk about his relationship to prayer since Jesus came and died and rose again and returned to glory Satan's work on earth is to destroy everything that Jesus builds if he possibly can that is why I warn everyone I baptize expect the devil to rob you of that blessing in some subtle way soon after that's what he tried to do with Jesus what was the blessing Jesus had in his baptism the blessing Jesus had was an assurance of his sonship you are my beloved son so what did the devil say to him within six weeks the devil said if you are the son of God and he sowed the seed of doubt about the very assurance that he'd had so he's trying to destroy everything that Jesus is building if he's the prince of power of the air then when wherever I am in the atmosphere of earth and I pray then his territory lies between me and heaven as I've already said and I have to break through enemy territory to communicate that's my problem therefore the two things that the devil will try to do is number one to stop me praying and number two if I man manage to start to spoil it and we're not ignorant of his tricks thank God the Bible makes them clear how does he stop my prayer? Well, depending on my temperament, he attacks one of the three parts of my personality. I've got a heart, a mind, or a will, and depending on my temperament, whether I'm sanguine or choleric or phlegmatic or whatever the fourth one is, he, he attacks one of these three points so that I don't know which way he gets at you most.